from Jazz Hands. Woo! We have Frederick Johnson, the host of Frederick Johnson in Conversation on YouTube, which reminds us what must we do? We must like and subscribe to the channel. Right, <laughs> Frederick? What do we got to do? Like and subscribe to the channel. And like and subscribe to his as well. Okay. All right. So he's got some. We're going to start off with the mind bending question, the standard question. <laughs> How would you describe the taste of a banana to someone who's never had one? Oh, wow. The taste of a banana to someone who's never had one, I would probably say the first word that comes to mind is mushy. Mm. So I'd probably say um, this is a fruit. Uh, hopefully they'll know what a fruit is, but I'll say this is a fruit. It's mushy. Uh, it, there's a sweetness to it. Um, and, uh, what's that word where kind of like when you're chewing on some, because when you chew on a banana, it's kind of, you, you know what I'm saying? It's kind of sticks around in your mouth or something. Like, I don't know, maybe that's still mushy. I don't know. I don't know what that adjective is, but, um, that's the best way. And I would describe it as a fruit that's kind of inside a casing. So to speak, you've got to peel it. You don't it. taste the casing or do you? You don't taste the casing. You don't, even though actually, believe it or not, believe it or not, I just learned this very recently. There's a vegan food blogger who's just started this whole thing about how she's cooking with banana peels. So I'm just saying. <laughs> well, you know, they did use it as fuel in Back to the Future. Right. <laughs> So who knows? Maybe banana peels are the future. Right. Who knows? Who knows? Definitely a mushy thing, isn't it? It's a texture thing with a banana. It's a mushy, te exactly. It's a texture thing. Yeah. Which I kind of feel like is even more potent than the sweet. Like you kind of, you, you are going to get some taste out of it, but it almost seems like the taste is not as intense as just the mushiness and the texture. Yes. Why is it so popular though? Like banana puddings, <laughs> you know, like banana medicine. It's so popular and yet there's no texture in that. It's, well, I think it's an easy fruit. Um, the reason why I know I tend to choose bananas, even though I like a lot of different types of fruit, it's easier than peeling an orange. It's less work. Um, even sometimes with an apple, I feel like apples kind of... Um, you got to deal with the core in the end. You're ending up eating around it unless you're going to slice it. It just seems like it's a little more, it's more complicated. There's um, no pips. There's no pips. And bananas are just easy. So you peel and you're done. And then you can either throw it in a smoothie or put it on cereal or put whatever you're going to do. But um, I, I just find it's an easier fruit to, to access. Mm, mm. Okay, well, moving on. If you haven't subscribed already, there's goodies now. So tell us, Frederick, when was your first existential life crisis as a child? Okay. Um, wow, we're going, we're going from light to heavy, even though I don't know, maybe psychologically the banana question is heavy and I just didn't realize it. But... Um, <laughs> But I will tell you, um, when I was, I think I was maybe four years old, I witnessed a violent incident between my parents. Whoa. Okay. I mean, not only did I witness it, I was kind of in the crosshairs of it. So I was in the crosshairs of this very violent incident between my father and my mother that, you know, resulted in... Um, you know, my mother having an accident of sorts because of the violent incident. Oh, and sorry. I'll tell you, it was, not only was it extremely traumatic in real time, but that is kind of the singular life event that really set the stage for um, how to really kind of cope and manage life and people in situations after like that's the origin story of, of of it all like if there was a lot to have to undo for healing 
it was kind of, that was where it all began. And I honestly didn't know that until I actually really forgot about, because I was so young when it happened. For many years in my life, I just forgot about it. Not, not that if someone wouldn't have brought it up, I wouldn't have like, oh yeah, that happened. Not that I would not have remembered. I just didn't think about it, you know, um, for many, 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 many years. And then I was doing some spiritual work, I would say in my late thirties. And I really looked at it um, deliberately for the first time in my life. Like there was an opportunity to really just kind of like uh, examine it. It was, it was some work around self-examination and life examination. So I really had an opportunity to look at it. And then I saw, like what I saw was, oh my God, it was really a running thread. Uh, you know, that, that, you know, just pretty much the way I reacted to certain things in life, the way that I was, um, whether that might be fear, whether it might be, um, you know, anxiety, you know, what, whatever the reaction might have been, like I could kind of, it was tracking, I could kind of track it all the way back to that. So I, but I didn't know that until what was unearthed in the spiritual work I was doing all those years later. So I would say that was the first life existential crisis. So what did you discover that you had a perception of that now you've changed from doing that spiritual work? Oh, that's a great question. Because well, because so many things have transformed. I think they've even transformed on levels so deep. I, I can't even articulate it to, to myself. Like it's kind of like a knowingness in that um, there is a shift. But let me think of a concrete example. Um, oh, here's here's one. A very a very basic, simple one, but just avoiding anything that would seem like it could elicit confrontation, and then actually confusing confrontation really with just um, addressing an issue. Like I, I, I kind of had a, f a false idea about what, because I think there was so much terror in what I saw as, as confrontation, uh, which really was confrontation. Anything that could possibly involve in my mind thinking that like, oh, this could be, this could, this could foster some sort of conflict. I just completely stayed away from. Um, a lot of it was delusional because when I looked back at those situations, they weren't the types of things that would have necessarily, like it was, I thought it was conflict. Like I thought it was bad or I thought it was, and it really could have honestly just really just be, been me not taking care of myself or standing up for myself or um, maybe honestly, just, or using my voice. That's the thing, using my voice. And I think, Going back to that origin story, um, I felt completely helpless. Uh, I didn't have a voice. Something was happening to me and around me that I felt completely powerless and helpless over. And I didn't have a voice. So I think I just maybe mischaracterized many things in my life along those lines that weren't necessarily that thing. So I would say one huge difference and shift when to answer your question about the way I live my life now is that after years of practice and continued practice, um, the use of my voice in support of myself, um, courage mm. via my voice. Does that make sense? So when you say that you realized that you were looking at the world a certain way, you were confusing conflict with actually sim simply speaking up for yourself, which is yeah. very, very common for when people are younger as children, they uh, have this perception and you run your life this way, right? It, they, I believe it's also called uh, the locale of a focus, right? This is where you've started to see the world. And then when you did that work, did you find that you were naturally not finding as much conflict because it was simply a conversation? Exactly, exactly. And, and I didn't, um, when I had the conversation, the fear I always had was like the Wicked Witch and the Wizard of Oz, I was just gonna melt into a nothingness never to be seen again. Like I was just gonna disintegrate. Like mm -hmm. I was going to use my voice and just kind of like disappear into thin air, never to be safe. And I, it, like, it didn't kill me. Like I used my voice. I had a conversation that simple, 
Paula, oftentimes it was really that simple. And I think in the beginning, maybe I did it with a little like kind of shivering in my voice and kind of a little shaking in my boots, uh, even though there was no reason to, but in, in my mind that, that was still, I still had that perception, but I was, I was taking an action that was, um, out of the comfort zone, contrary to what my mind might have been saying. Um, and then I just found out like, oh my God, I didn't melt. Oh my God, I didn't die. Oh wow, I didn't, I didn't kind of disappear into nothingness. Like it, it's not only did that not happen, but it's okay, everything's fine. Do you think that could be categorized as a, um, a victim mentality that you were perpetuating until you realized that you weren't actually a victim, you were simply standing up for yourself or having a conversation. Yeah. And yeah. as a result, your world viewpoint changed. Yeah. And yeah. did you experience any more productivity in your life because you were less burdened with a mentality of people always coming at you. Uh, they're going to get me. I have to prepare for the worst case scenario. Can you uh, find any tangible situation or just express the difference you felt? There's an absolute difference. Um, so much of it has to do with even, even just energy. Even, even, be, even Definitely there's been a physical difference in what like literally I've been able to do um, having an absence of, of that kind of really as a driving force in my life. Um, but really just from like an energy standpoint, I didn't realize, I'll put it to you this way. Before I started doing that work that I, I had started doing, I think up to that point in my life and even maybe even through that point until like I was kind of really transcended a lot of it and was transformed by a lot of it. I always just say, I was like surviving. I was a survivor. I never really was somebody that was living. Like all through my teens, my 20s and my 30s up to that point, I was one of those people that was just getting from point A to point B. You know, I was just surviving. It was just all about, you know, self-reliance and self-sufficiency. And as, as I had an old friend who used to say, um, trying to make a dollar out of 15 cents. Like that's kind of what it was. My whole life, I was just trying to make a dollar out of fifteen cents. We say, I mean, wait, yeah, we say making a mountain out of a molehill. We got to create some drama for me to be the victim, wait, right? Wait, or it was just like that's how hard I felt. Like I was survived. Like I was constant. I was always behind the eight ball. You know, three steps forward, two steps back. Just made it. You know, whew, just bear. You know, just that was kind of how I did life from that energy, and a lot of that was driven by all of that fear. You know, fears around people I didn't even know I had, fears mm -hmm. about things I didn't even know I had. Mm -hmm. You know, fears about. So a lot of it that that it was exhausting. I mean, it really, Paul. It was an absolute exhausting way to live. I mean, I just literally just burned myself out. But I, but that was kind of the place that I lived from. Um, th there was definitely a restlessness about me, how I, how I lived. And, you know, I would moved a lot and I, you know, went to different cities and tried different jobs. And, and a lot of it too, was just me trying to find myself, you know, I was trying to find, but what I was really trying to find was where is that place going to be where I can just exhale? You know, like Terry McMillan wrote that book years ago, waiting to exhale. I was just waiting to exhale. Like I was just. Where am I going to get to wherever where I can finally just sit down and be like, Phew, and that never came because I didn't realize that the problem was residing inside myself. So I like, like a lot of people, you know, I was just kind of looking for the external thing that was going to be like, oh, I finally made it to the promised land. Uh, Frederick can now be happy and relaxed. And I never made it to that land. And, um, once I really started kind of, you know, doing the necessary work to really have, you know, an awakening and have a transformation within self, um, increment, I mean, number one, there was a big change. So there was a big shift, I think, just from the awareness and the realization of it all. So there was a big change. And then over the years, there's just been 
just a con continuous incremental changes, you know, like it's just kind of like, I just still keep, you know, I'm still growing along those lines, moving the right direction. So by no means did I kind of like, oh, I got the lesson and it was over. It's really just been this continuous journey. But what it is, is that like, I'm not using my energy in that way. And once I stopped doing that, here was the crazy thing. I was able to kind of like stay in one place and not feel like I had to be here and be there and be that, you know, meaning um, I didn't have a job I think my average length of a job was maybe like a year or a year and three months. This until a great situations. Were you fired? No, I was. <laughs> <laughs> it was the restlessness. It oh, was the restlessness. I was never. Either, there was a fear of recreating this trauma all over again. Then yeah. You move oh, on, right? Oh, prob probably, probably. No, I will tell you there were a couple of times I left before I probably would have gotten fired. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And I call that what I kind of thought of that as like the dignified thing to do in my mind at the time. I'll leave before they fire me. You know, like I was saving them some trouble. But right. there was a couple of those, but more than not, more often it was looking for that the grass was going to be greener in this other place. So I kind of thought, oh I'm going to find myself there. So I just never could really anchor myself in anything because it was just like oh the answer is going to be in san francisco so let me go there oh the answer is going to be in new york city so let me go there so that's what a lot of the moving was so i would just up and leave a life circumstance even if it might have been something that could have been positive beneficial maybe I, if i'd stayed i'd been able i could maybe build something at that place but i just didn't have that consciousness um in here or or in here like i just didn't have that consciousness so I had to, I had to go. One of the things that came out of um, the transformation of it all was that I was able to learn how to just be where I was, regardless of external circumstances. And even sometimes regardless of internal circumstances, like I didn't have to cut and run, so to speak. Mm -hmm. So, you know, then, so it's interesting. Then I found myself gainfully employed at places for really long periods of time. I found myself able to save money. You know, I found myself able to um, do multiple things and a myriad of things without feeling like I was exhausted and spinning because I wasn't, I wasn't surviving. Like I was really living. And so because I was really living from the inside, um, that's a whole different type of energy than surviving and just trying to get, you know, push through it all. So as you've had this change and you're talking about you were able to now have quiet time going inward, connecting. We are, of course, meditation channel about how people go on their path to go inward. How has that shifted you giving back to the world? Well, one way that is that's really key is that, you know, I am a part of a spiritual community where um service is key, you mm. know, um, w you know, within that community specifically. So, you know, my continued participation in that, um, you know, is critical. It's critical to, to my sanity and my, and my, you know, just spiritual sanity. Um, so it's critical that I continue to do that. So that, that's something that I do very specifically within that spiritual community. Um, but, what's most important is that it's taking it out into the world. So like what I found, and this is an interesting, it's kind of an interesting distinction, just like before when you were talking about, oh, I thought it was conflict, but it was really maybe just having a conversation. The interesting thing is, is that before I was a person that I thought I was really giving, um, but I didn't know that it was from, oftentimes it was from a place of self-interest. Oh, so let's, it was- let's, let's, let's take that. Okay, because this is kind of answering your, this is going to answer your question. It's very um, um, important. And we're going to continue with that. But okay. many, many people are of service or even working in charitable organizations. And, or, and it is a will to make the world a better place. Yeah. And there is this strain and this stress. Yeah. Right? Yeah when we started with some events with them nonprofit and I said, Hey, I just want you to know. Yeah. It's a fundraiser. Yeah. It's a show, but you know what? 
we're here for joy and bliss. And this means we will get a bit stressed out, but we're not going to be killing ourselves for a cause. Because if we do that, there is no space for energy, consciousness, universe to come yeah, in yeah. and provide in flow. Yeah. Because we are not exuding bliss or joy with what we're doing and we will not be uplifted. We will be going to that well and we will be coming up empty over and over and over again, right? And so yeah. it's very important with what we're doing here. We're talking about a shift in consciousness and being of service because yes. it's not a matter of giving. It's how and when. And yes. when we go to source, we can then begin to have discern intuition of yes i'm going to go here yeah and be of service so please yeah. continue no I, I, I absolutely everything you said i can i completely agree and 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 understand um along those lines one of the things that i found like when i kind of looked back i looked back at the old way of living and thinking and because I really thought I was this guy that really was, oh, I'll give you the shirt off my back, which I, there were times literally I gave somebody the shirt off my back, but I didn't see the truth about myself, like in, in, in it all, you know what I'm saying? So there, so there was still, there was a selfishness, there was a self-centeredness, there was an agenda, there was, there was all these things. And there was kind of just my own spiritual sickness that I was all wrapped up in. So even when I was being that, you know, that nice guy, I thought I was that nice guy, you know, uh, and it wasn't even necessarily that maybe other people didn't even perceive me that way. They're just, it wasn't the whole truth about what was really going on within, you know? And so oftentimes um, my generosity really was perhaps maybe to get people to think a certain thing about me to get people to feel a certain way about me, to maintain a relationship or uh, maintain a dynamic within a relationship, whatever. So all of that still, none, none of that was, none of that was like, it was not coming from what you were just talking about, which was a pure place of just being of service. Because when it's just a pure place of being of service, there aren't any caveats, there's no contingencies, there's no quid pro quo, there's none of that. It really is just me giving of self for the sake of giving of self and, and that's it. And so what's different today is um, it, it's kind of, I love how just I can do that in any space that I'm in, you know, with, with anyone that I'm with. So I kind of find a lot of times it's just holding an unconditional loving space as I'm just making my way through my public life, you know, whether that's in the grocery store, you know, whether that's a, a customer service situation, um, whether that's uh, even with family, really just kind of, you know, being a certain space that's just there to, maybe I'm just there to listen. Maybe I'm just, you know, whatever the case may be, it's really like a spirit of just unconditional love, you know, uh, and when I say tolerance, I don't mean tolerance in the sense of like, like, you know, I'm tolerating you, even though I don't like it, I'm telling you, I mean like, like spiritual tolerance. Yes. <laughs> What would you like? I mean, spirit, you know. What would you like to leave as a legacy when you're gone? Whether it's physical, knowledge base, what would you like to do after you've had this change, this spiritual awakening, you give back? What would you like to leave having made the world a better place when you're not here anymore? You know, I think what I want to leave now is just... Um, an impact that someone's going to take with them that will be a positive informing of their own life. Uh, and what I mean by that is, and maybe I would have answered this question differently even just a few years ago, maybe it would have been a thing I thought I needed to leave or a thing I thought I needed to, to kind of bequest or something to say, here's my legacy. I left this for what have you organization. But I think when I think about the people who aren't here anymore, I have an aunt who passed away from lung cancer last year. She was my father's last remaining sibling. And 
she was a became a go-to person for me. Now, all my life growing up, you know, when you're a kid, you don't care about your aunts and uncles and their advice or whatever. You know, even when you're younger, it's like it wasn't until later in my life that I was able to appreciate a relationship with her. And so she became uh, a go-to person when I needed kind of like spiritual counsel, you know, a confidant, you know, wisdom, the type of wisdom that she had. And what's interesting is that what she, she really kind of gave me elements of um, my character today that really truly has impacted choices I make in my daily life, you know, because of that. Like, so that's what I mean about what she left was an impact that's really kind of informed my life in a really positive and beautiful and constructive way. Because like now, I mean, A, yes, I wanted to, um, I needed to have the ability to kind of access and receive and want to apply what she was sharing. But for me, that was like, part of her legacy, if not all, but it was an element of her legacy is that literally she gave me something intangible that is um, a part of like the DNA of my character that has impacted the, the way that I live my life, the choices I make, how I relate to people because um, that, so I, that, that's kind of what I'd like to leave. So wisdom for, for individuals to follow and remembering your knowledge. So with that, if you want to hear more from Frederick, I want you to write it in the comments if you loved him and we want to have him back for longer to expound on I already would love God. to come back. You know, I have a talk show called Frederick Johnson in Conversation, so I love conversation. So yeah. I, I we're figured that out. <laughs> and so uh, we want you to like and subscribe. And right now, if you want to wait for the extended to drop, because you're going to get some more questions answered from Frederick. And until then, we'll see you with the next interview.